Protectors of the Suna Suna Baba Protector of the Suna In alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of our Sunnah followers hadith class. And this is the class wherein we are studying hadiths uh, from the new, uh, from the book entitled Once Upon a Time. And this is a book of hadiths compiled by Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli. And these are wonderful hadiths taken from the sitta uh, that help us to understand life a little better because each one of these hadiths are stories from the people that came before us that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has shared with us because they all have lessons to be learned. And today's story is very intriguing. Today's story is one that should inspire each and every one of us to have hope, especially when times are bad. And the lesson learned in this hadith is to die hard. I repeat, die hard. I repeat, die hard. Live well and die hard. Can you think which hadith it will be tonight? Let's see if your guess was right. So let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen for tonight's wonderful, inspiring, enlightening hadith. And here's the PowerPoint. And let's see if your guess was right as to which hadith this is. What is the story of the hadith here? Well, there it is. This is the story taken from Sahih Muslim. It's the hadith that speaks about the magician, the monk, the boy, and the people of the ditch. Was your answer correct today? Well, let's see. How can this story of the people of the ditch, this story about magicians and monks and magic, what does this have to do with dying hard? Well, let's review the story. And here's a picture of Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli. This is a picture of the book. It is not yet available on his website but when it will be soon, I hope, inshallah. And this is the ad, uh, website address of his, www.atlyonline.com. And this is our uh, website, sunnahfollowers.net. So now let's get on with the story of the magician, the monk, the young boy, and the people of the ditch. And again, this hadith, is narrated to us from Sahih Muslim. Uh, he reports that Suwaib tells us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there used to live before us a king and he had a court magician. This was the norm back in those days, the days known as the medieval period of history in medieval times you know every palace had its court and every court had its king and every king had its courtiers and every courtier had included a magician okay a magician so this king had his court magician but the magician began to grow older in age and so one day the magician approached the king and he said, oh king, I have grown old. So send to me a young boy so I can teach him my magic and he can replace me should I die. The king agreed and he worked to find a young boy who could serve as an apprentice to the magician. 
And he thus succeeded in finding a very intelligent, able young man. And he instructed this young man to go meet with the court magician and study his craft, study his art, so he can become his apprentice. So the young boy obeyed the king and he left his home the next morning and set out to meet with the magician at the palace so he can begin his training. But on his way to the palace, he happened to come upon a monk, a monk who was sitting in the middle of the road, surrounded by a small audience of people. And the monk was speaking to them about a law. I want you guys to remember the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that every nation of people had prophets sent to them and messengers sent to them. So everyone has been, every nation has been told about Allah and la ilaha illallah, how Allah has no partner. Even in this time, in the medieval period, okay, this man was not a prophet, but he was a messenger. And one of the things that I explain to you guys all the time, you know, you don't have to be a prophet of Allah to be a messenger. If you have devoted your life to calling the people to the true belief system, that makes you a messenger. Just as this monk was, he was not a prophet at all. He was just a messenger amongst the people. He was reminding the people to believe in Allah and to fear Allah and to live by the laws of Allah and not give in to the laws of man. Because back in those days, the kings viewed themselves as, as being gods. Well, this monk was reminding the people there is only one God and that is Allah. So as this young boy was trying to get to the palace, he happened upon this monk and he listened and he liked what the monk was saying. He was very impressed with the reminders that this monk was conveying to the people. And so he went on his way and went on and learned his uh, lessons from uh, the magician. But every day on his way to the palace to learn, he would stop and listen to the monk. And that meant each day, he would become later and later in meeting with his mentor, his teacher, the magician. Now, in the meantime, the magician did not know why this young lad was late every day. So having lost his patience one day, when the boy arrived, the magician began to lash him, to beat him. He said, you know what time you're supposed to meet here with me. And I tire of your coming late every day. So the magician beat him with a whip. The boy went home and the next day, as he was walking to the palace, he stopped before the monk and he complained to the monk of his lashing. He told the monk, I won't be able to listen to you like I normally do because yesterday, you know, my master became angry because I was late and he whipped me. The monk then said to him, let me tell you something. The next time when you feel afraid that the magician will beat you for being late, tell him that the reason you were late was because your family detained you. And then when you are arriving home, if you feel that your family uh, will be angry, tell them that the reason that you're late is because the magician detained you. So here you can see uh, this monk, you know, was a conveyor of the truth. He was a daya. He's what we call a daya. And the boy liked listening to him and learning for him, listening to his remembrance, his reminders of Allah. So he would be late going home, 
and late going to work each day because he would stop and listen to what the monk had to say. So the monk told him, this is what you can do, you know, to get out of being abused, you know, for being late arriving home or late getting to your appointment. He said, I just want to tell you, you know, do this and inshallah, everything will go fine for you. So the young boy listened. And so he continued to go to his uh, training as an apprentice with the, with the magician. And it just so happened that one day when he was on his way to the palace, a huge beast of prey was standing in the middle of the road, blocking the people from passing by. The young boy then said, this is the day that I will know who is stronger and more superior, the magician or the monk. So he picked up a rock and he said, oh Allah, if what the monk is doing is more beloved to you than what the magician is doing, then cause the death of this animal so that we can move about freely to get to where we need to go. And then the young man threw the rock towards the beast. It hit the beast and it killed it. And now the people were able to move freely towards the palace. Okay, so the young boy arrived uh, 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 on his way. He continued on his way to uh, the palace. And he happened to come upon the monk and he explained to the monk what had happened. And the monk laughed and was proud. He said, oh, my son, today you are better than me. He said, I have a feeling that pretty soon you will be put to test in regards to your faith and your belief in Allah. He said, when this happens, I ask only one thing, don't give my name as a clue. The young boy was like, what are you talking about? Are you, you're speaking in riddles. I don't understand what you're saying. And the monk told him, of course you don't understand what I'm saying now, but soon you will because you have grown even more than me in your belief in Allah. The simple fact, that remember we talked yesterday about how sometimes we may find ourselves in situations that we can't get out of. So we can call upon Allah for help, you know, asking Allah, you know, to help us based on the good deeds that we did. Well, look at what this young man did. He said, oh Allah, if what, if you are more pleased that with what the monk is doing, then let this rock, kill this beast and it did and so that's what the monk meant when he said you're smarter than me your faith is stronger than mine but the day is gonna come because remember the stronger we grow in our faith the greater our trials will be too the greater our tests will be that's how allah is the closer we become to allah the more he will test us to see if we are worthy of that closeness. So that's what this monk was trying to tell the young boy. He said, you have grown in your faith and you will be tested. But when you are tested, just don't give my name. So the young boy didn't know what the monk meant, but he went on and continued uh, about his business to the palace you know, and learned from his uh, mentor. And then the next day, when the boy woke up, he discovered that there was something different about him. He discovered that he was able to treat people who were sick. He was able to treat people who was blind. So the young man began to use this new gift to heal people who had leprosy. He used his new gift to heal people who had blindness and sickness. Eventually the word of this young man began to travel through the kingdom. You know, a lot of people thought it was just magic. 
because back in those days, people believed in magic. This is when the jinn were rampant. The jinn had convinced the people that what Harut and what Marut taught was magic when it wasn't magic. So people were into magic then. So that word got around that this young apprentice had studied from the king's magician and he had become a great magician. He could heal you and make your sicknesses go away. So it just so happened that one of the king's courtiers became sick and lost his eyesight. And one of his slaves told him, haven't you heard of the new apprentice that the magician has? He can heal you. He can use magic and heal you and make you see again. So the courtier asked, he said, where does this young boy live? And after giving his home address, the courtier set out with his slaves to the home of this young boy. And when he went to this young boy's home, he went bearing numerous gifts of gold and silver and all kind of jewels. And the man said, I heard that you are a magician and that you can cure all illnesses. He said, I am the king's courtier. I was allowed to sit with the king and help him to judge between the disputes of men. But since I've lost my eyesight, I'm not able to do so. If you cure me of my eyesight, then all these things that I brought, all these gifts I brought can be yours. The young man answered the man. He said, I want you to understand that I don't have the ability to cure anyone. He said, it is Allah who is the one doing the curing. I am just the tool that Allah is using. He said, it's not magic. This is not magic. He said, this is the cotter of Allah. Allah is the one that's guiding me to do what I do. He said, and you don't have to pay me anything. He said, all you have to do is affirm your belief in Allah. All you have to do is testify that there is no God but Allah. And he is the, the one who has the power. If you do this, then I will call upon Allah and I will ask Allah to cure you. So the courtier who he wanted to see, so he said, okay, I'll do that. The courtier raised his hands. He said, I believe and I testify that there is no God but Allah and the power lies in his hands. And when the courtier did that, the young man said, oh Allah, heal him of his eyes. And afterwards, the courtier was able to see. He was able to see instantly. And so he thanked the young boy. And then the courtier and his servants, they went back to the palace. And the next day, the courtier took his seat next to the king where he used to sit, sit before he lost his eyesight. The king was surprised to see the man. He said to him, what happened? You were blind. Who gave you back your eyesight? And the courtier looked at the king and said, Allah, my Lord did. The king then asked him, he said, are you saying that your Lord, that there is another Lord besides me? The man said, yes, your Lord and my Lord is the same. Your Lord and my Lord is Allah. You are not the Lord of me. You are not the Lord of anyone. This made the king angry. Because again, in this time, the kings were worshiped as gods. 
So the king became angry. He stood up and took hold of the man and began to beat him and torture him he, until the man cried out the name of the young boy. He said, it's the young boy. It was the young boy, the young apprentice who restored my eyes. When he mentioned the young boy as being the one who restored his eyes, the king then released the man and he ordered his servants to go and fetch uh, the young boy. He said, go fetch the apprentice of the magician and bring him to me. And the king's men listened. They went and got the young man, dragged him to the palace, and the king addressed the boy. He said, oh boy, it has been told to me that you have become so proficient in your magic that you can cure the blind and you can cure people who suffer with sicknesses. The young boy said, I don't cure anyone. It is a law who does the curing. I simply supplicate and call upon a law to do the curing. The king then angry, he grabbed the young boy and began to beat him unmercifully, began to beat him and torture him until the young boy let slip from his tongue the name of the monk. And this is the thing that the monk was talking about. And after the boy had slipped out the name of the monk, he then understood what the monk has said, but the young man couldn't take it back. So having revealed the name of the monk, the king then released the young boy and he told his men, go out and find this monk and bring him to me immediately. So the king's men went out and they found the monk and they summoned him before the king. And the king looked at the monk and said, you need to denounce your religion. Denounce your religion and say that I am your Lord. I am your God. The monk looked at the king and told him, I can't do that. The king said, I'm gonna ask you one last time, denounce your religion and proclaim that I am the Lord of the earth. The monk refused again. So the king then ordered for a saw to be brought forward. And he ordered the man to be tied down. And then the king placed the saw in the middle of the monk's head and sawed his head until his head fell apart in pieces. But the king wasn't done. After sawing the monk's head in half, the king then commanded that his courtier be brought forward. So the courtier was brought forward and the king said, I'm giving you this one chance, turn back from your religion and bow to me and accept that I am God, the Lord of the land. The courtier looked at the king and he too refused. So the king ordered his men to grab the courtier and they tied him up and the king took the saw and they sawed him in the middle of his head until his head was sawed to pieces too. Again, look at the faith. The faith that these two men had, that monk, that monk, that monk believed in Allah. He was willing to give up his life and forfeit his life. And then look at the courtier. The courtier had to live in darkness for a while. And I'm going to tell you something, guys. Sometimes things can happen in our lives that are so bad that it can bring us to change. 
living in darkness, unable to see. This is the worst thing that can happen to a person, you know, to be able to see. And then one day your eyes are gone and you living in nothing but total darkness. And then for a law to restore that light to you. That can be life changing. This man was thankful to Allah for giving him back his life. He knew without a doubt that there was only one God. He knew without a doubt that Allah is Allah and he is Akbar and not no king. So he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice of his life rather than denounce Allah. Remember guys, I, one of the things that I try to emphasize here, you know, each day when you wake up in the morning, after you thank Allah for putting your soul into your body, ask yourself, what sacrifices am I willing to make today for Allah? Well, here are two men who sacrificed their lives for Allah. So after sawing these two men in half, the king was angry. He said, bring me the young apprentice. Someone bring him back to me, because he was already imprisoned. So they went and fetched a young boy and brought him to, to the king. The king said, I've killed your friend, the monk, and I've killed the courtier. He said, turn back from your religion now, or I will kill you. The boy refused to turn back from his religion. So the king ordered his men and said, I want you all to tie him up, and I want you to take him to such and such mountain. And when you climb the top of it with him, Ask him to renounce his faith. But if he refuses, then I want you to throw him down the mountain. His men listened and they obeyed. So what they did was they tied the young man's hands together and they left the palace with him, dragging him along. And they climbed up to the top of this mountain with him. And when they reached the top, they asked the man, the young boy, are you going to renounce your faith? The young man raised his hands and he said, oh Allah, protect me. Oh Allah, save me from these men. And as soon as the, man, the boy had raised his hands, the mountain began to shake. The mountain began to quake. And then suddenly all the king's men were falling from the mountain. They all were falling off the mountain. After they met their demise, the young boy thanked Allah and he gathered his wits together and he walked back to the palace. And I'm gonna tell you guys, this is what happens sometimes. You know, we'll go through a trial in life and then Allah will come and get us out of that predicament. And it just boosts up our Iman even more. It gives us more strength, more motivation. We feel like there's nothing we can't face because we know we have a law. And that's how this young boy felt. He didn't run away. When he saw how Allah answered him, it built up his strength and his reserve, and he walked back to the palace and he met the king head on. And when the king saw the boy enter, the king was shocked. He said, what are you doing here? Where are my men? The boy looked at the king and smiled. He said, Allah saved me from your men. The king became even more infuriated. He looked at his guard and said, get him, tie him up and carry him in a small boat and take him out into the ocean 
And when you reach the middle of the ocean, I want you to tell him to renounce his religion. But if he does not renounce it, then throw him in the water, throw him off the boat and toss him into the water. Subhanallah. So his armed men gathered the boy and tied up his hands and his feet. And then they took him out to a boat and they sailed out on the ocean with him. And when they reached the middle of the ocean, they were away from the land enough. They asked the boy to renounce his faith. The young boy asked him, can you untie my hands so I can, do, so I can say what I have to say? They untied his hands. And again, the young boy raised his hands to the sky. And he said, oh, Allah, save me from these men and save me from what they want to do to me. Immediately, before he could even bring his hands back down, the boat began to rock back and forth and it eventually turned over, thus drowning all the men. The young boy was able to undo the ropes on his feet and he swam himself back to shore. And again, he walked back to the palace. Again, his faith renewed. He knew he was a believer. He feared nothing. He feared no one but Allah. So he walked back to the palace, again, surprising the king. And when the king saw him, the king jumped up from his throne. He said, what have you done? Where are my men? The young boy said, Allah, again, save me from your men. And then he looked at the king and said, you can't kill me. The only way that you can kill me is to do what I ask you to do. And at this time, guys, the palace was filled with a lot of people who had heard about what was going on. The palace was filled with a lot of people who had come to witness this event. The king said, okay, what can I do to have to kill you? The boy said, to kill me, you have to gather the people in the plain and then hang me by the trunk of a tree. And then you have to get an arrow and then before you shoot me with the arrow, you have to say in the name of Allah, the Lord of the young boy, and then let the arrow fly from its bow, and then you'll be able to kill me. So imagine, at this point, the king had a great audience. The people were all standing by watching. So the king said, okay, we'll do this. He called the people, everyone, to follow him to an open plain. And when he reached the open plain, he had his men tie the young boy to the trunk of a tree. And then the king himself took hold of an arrow from his quiver and he placed it in the bow. And he said, in the name of Allah, the Lord of the young man. And then he shot the arrow. The arrow hit the boy in his temple, killing him. Subhana Allah, Subhana Allah. All of a sudden, the people began to yell. All of a sudden, the people began to clap. The king thought they were clapping and yelling to see how great and magnificent he was. But then as he listened, he heard them yelling, but they weren't praising him. They weren't glorifying him. They were saying, la Allah, la la we attest and affirm our belief in Allah, the Lord of this young man. We affirm our faith and our belief in Allah, the Lord of this young man. See the wisdom. This is what the monk meant when he told the young man that he had surpassed him in his closeness to Allah. 
This boy was intelligent. They lived in a land in which men were viewing men as being gods. There is but only one God, and that is a law. So this boy made the ultimate sacrifice, just like the monk did, just like the courtier did. But his sacrifice was on a greater scale because he told the king how to kill him, knowing that the king would bring all the people of the village to witness it. Knowing that once all the people in the village witnessed it, they could not help but believe, that the king is not God, because the boy told him how to kill him. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So you can imagine the anger that the king had when he realized that the people were chanting their belief in Allah, the omnipotent, and not their belief in him. So the king became even more angry. The courtiers, they ran to him and they said, oh, your majesty, look at what you've done. Don't you see that Allah has actually done the one thing that you were trying to prevent? By killing that boy the way he said and him dying the way that the only way he said he could die, all you've done is affirm the people's belief in Allah. So the king said, well, I know what to do. He commanded his men to go and dig ditches. He said, I want a ditch to be dug at every important point of the road. So his armed men listened and they began to dig, to dig ditches. Again, this king was not going to accept defeat. So after the ditches were dug, the king then ordered fire be lit inside them. And as all the village people stood by watching women, men, and children, the king faced his people and he said, whoever does not turn back from this boy's religion, whoever does not denounce this religion, I will throw you in the fire. Even though the people feared death, they feared Allah even more because they witnessed the miracles. They witnessed the fact that this boy could call upon Allah and ask Allah to cure them of their sicknesses and Allah would do so. They knew about the monk. They knew about the courtier. They knew about how the king tried to kill this man several times and failed, that he only succeeded by the boy telling him how. So the people, believe it or not, they refused to renounce their religion. And instead, they all walked and themselves into the fire. All the people began to walk into the fire themselves until there was only one person left. And that was a woman who held a newborn baby in her arms. When her time came, the king looked at her. He said, well, here's one I got. She's not going to renounce. He said, renounce your faith. But to the king's surprise and to the surprise of his men, the newborn baby raised up its head and it looked at the king and then it looked at its mother and it said, oh, mother, endure this ordeal because you are on the right path without any further hesitation the woman jumped into the fire subhana allah subhana allah subhana allah this is the, one of the children we talked about how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us that there were ch three children that spoke from the cradle this is the one. This is one of those three that spoke from the cradle. Jesus was another, but this is one of the ones that spoke from the cradle. 
So can you imagine how that king looked and how he felt when that child raised his head, looked at him, then looked at its mom and said, don't worry, you're on the right path. Without any hesitation, I would have done it too. She jumped, subhanAllah. Allah. How many of us would have jumped? How many of us would have jumped? Especially today. Remember the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that each nation of people will become further and further and further away from the truth. And our faith will become weaker and weaker. Today, there's so many weak Muslims we don't want to wear beards. We don't want to wear hijabs. We don't want to pray. We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate uh, St. Patrick's Day. We celebrate Christmas, Easter. You know, we fornicate. We adulterate. We date. We drink. We do drugs. And we all claim we believe in the law. Look at the faith of the people of the ditch. A whole village a whole village, an entire village of people were told either denounce it, renounce your belief, or I'll throw you in. You ain't got to throw us. They all walked in with smiles on their faces. So again, this is a wonderful, wonderful story uh, taken from the book, uh, Once Upon a Time. And again, uh, this is a wonderful book compiled by Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli. You know, the hadiths in this book, all of them are like this, you know, stories that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shared with us from the people who came before us. Stories that contain lessons to be learned. Today's lesson, die hard. Today's lesson, Die hard. How many of us will die hard? Now do you guys get the name? Die hard. Hard upon your faith. I'd like to thank everybody for joining and participating in this session. Please make sure you guys tune in tomorrow for the next story from this wonderful book, Supana kala humu wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha ila anta, astakfiruka wa atubu.